Does everybody have a chai? No. <laughs> you have your tea? I got some. Oh, nice. Good one. Oh, hi, Marty. Marty's in the dark. Good morning, Bante. <laughs> Where are you now? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you very well. Hello, everyone. It's nice to see you. <laughs> um, I'm in Vermont. In Vermont. Lovely. Yes, it's beautiful here. Mm. Uh, just a bit early and mm. cold. Yes, I bet. Still in the truck? <laughs> I'm in the truck. I ah. just set myself up here and I don't disturb rat. Yes. Ah, uh, great. Good. The colors must be getting nice now. Fall is coming and uh, Vermont. It's so beautiful. So yes. beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Matthias, do you Very have this? Great. We're, we're also ha happy to have you. <laughs> Matthias, do you have the same phenomena happening in Finland when the leaves turn all kinds of colors? Nice. Mm -hmm. Yes, we call it Roska. Roska. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. That's great. Wonderful. So, well, um, yeah, let's see if, ah, there we are. <laughs> it's starting. Very good. So, as I was explaining on the group earlier, a um, few years back I used to uh, watch these series of talks by uh, Ajahn Sudanto. It was called Morning Coffee with Ajahn Sudanto. And um, yeah, I just thought it was uh, really good, Marty remembers, um, a really good, uh, yeah, a really good idea. I really liked how informal it was and just, uh, we could just, uh, we could just ask questions, talk a little bit about Dhamma. So we'll see how, how it goes today, how many people join and, um, at the same time, we can have a little catch up. Hello, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. yes very yes, well, yes, very yes. good. Wonderful. Sorry, yeah, sorry, I'm too late. Yeah. Ah, no, that's okay. That's very good. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I realized that uh, actually uh, a lot of questions come to me in the, in the month. Uh, so I just thought I would write them down and uh, if, if there's no nothing that uh, comes up right away we can we can look at what what came up during the month uh, we had a few email questions with Naveen was uh, helping with that and um, yeah and I I think I need to admit people so you might see me kind of uh, at work here a little bit sometimes so um, okay so what what happened this week did you have any uh, any uh, good things happening here t <laughs> today was a uh, today was a bit busy we had a lot of people we had Naveen's family visiting and offering Dana and um, yeah a lot of uh, getting ready for the Sri Lankan retreat. We just got a, a new sound system, so that was a big thing. Naveen brought this from Colombo, and um, uh, so we got all of this together. Uh, so we don't have to run around for next retreat, because that was a bit of a problem last time. Uh, we actually were never sure that the guy would deliver the speakers last time, because we're living like almost three hours from candy and uh yeah people here don't really <laughs> do these things <laughs> easily 
uh, delivering speakers out in the woods <laughs> for our meditation retreat. So, so this year should be good, a little bit less, less stressful <laughs> than getting to know on the day of the retreat. So, anything came up in the meditation? How was your week, uh, your month? <laughs> yes. I have a question. Mm -hmm. I have actually quite a few, but um, I'm sure the one that comes up for me based on your talk last month. Mm. It's about you. You described ter um, not always being there when you were leaving your kuti and you needed to turn off the light and then you realized oh for that time you weren't there mm -hmm. and i thought that was a very good description mm -hmm. but i br brought me a question about multitasking and <laughs> then so <laughs> you know there's a lot put on sort of being able to get a number of tasks done at once and so I understand the um, simplifying uh, so that you really there's an awareness of all the things that are happening but is there a point where the um, that that changes to being able to I'm gonna say multitask or is that just a, is multitasking just a fiction like is actually um, only one thing happening at a time. Anyway, I'll let you chew on that a bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good old multitasking. Yeah, I, I actually was talking about that recently. I had um, a couple of years back, I was in uh, San Francisco having lunch with uh, uh, a friend and a meditation teacher there. Um, and um, it was funny because they asked me, uh, because people in the West are not really used to monastic rules and things like that, so usually they don't, don't really know what to do with us. Um, <laughs> but um, they asked me, should we keep silent? Do you, want, do you want silence? Is that like part of your rules to like, keep silence while, while eating? And I was like, uh, actually, it's not really part of the rules, but I, I do prefer silence when I eat. Because I don't, I don't think I can eat and talk at the same time. <laughs> and uh, it's either like I'm doing one or the other. And then, and then we started in silence and then it, it was a bit forced. Like usually in the U.S. and Canada, like people are not really that happy with the monastic rules <laughs> because it feels very restrictive but uh, for us it's, it's we see it in a very different way but um, and then it's we, we started talking and then they could see that I was just holding my my spoon and just like fully listening and like for I don't know like 10 minutes <laughs> I was just like <laughs> and then answering and then and then they realize, oh, we should probably let him eat because he's not going to eat if we, if we talk to him. Because, <laughs> I don't know, my brain, can't, my brain can't do that anymore. I can't just like, rah, 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 and like, oh, yeah, 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 it was, it was nice, it was nice, or blah, this and that. Uh, it doesn't work. Like, it's, I'm either eating the food that I'm eating or or I'm doing something else but um, and so for me multitasking is basically I see it as restlessness and it's not necessarily unwholesome but it's just you know the word kusala can be also translated as unskillful so it's not necessarily unwholesome or it's not like bad but it just 
it's something that's not really meant to happen with mindfulness that much, like doing so many things all at once. And of course, sometimes you have to, like you, you're going to have to, I don't know, like for an emergency or like, well, sometimes there's many emergencies during the day. <laughs> I don't know um, what else, but sometimes you'll have to do something crazy, like multitasking. Um, <laughs> but... For me anyways, the more, more and more I realize that this multitasking thing is not, is not in line with Dhamma. It's either you're doing something fully or you're doing something else, but doing two things at the same time is kind of a recipe for doing both things halfway or not being fully present in the moment either. Because when the example I was giving last month about uh, turning off my light or like uh, just doing something quickly turn like uh, locking my door or like and turning my back to the door um, uh, it's basically that's what happens when you're trying to multitask is that you're somewhere else but you're still doing something <laughs> So, and that's when I realized that, uh, oh, well, I'm actually, I'm actually not there. I'm actually thinking about what's next, what's coming, what I'm going to say to this person, what, what will happen. So, um, and actually, I, in the Western mind, it's, a very, it's very deeply ingrained. So I would say... <laughs> um, it's it's one of the, those habits that is that is hard to break, uh, that is hard to recondition, uh, because the pace of life is is very fast and um, productive, so has to it's got to go. <laughs> For me, I I noticed in my I in my own practice actually. I notice, I notice multitasking in my mind as a distraction. I, like I use it to notice when I'm not present anymore. Is my brain is starting to do all kinds of things, and then it's starting to, oh, I now I gotta like do this, and then I'm gonna do that, and then I'm gonna do this, and then I realize like, oh, it's all good. Like it's all dumb, uh, very wholesome things, but. At some point, it becomes all together, and it's it basically just rubs your mindfulness. Like recently, I had, and then it comes back to also lifestyle. That's what I like about that is that it's not just a meditation practice. It's also, well, okay, so now this is too much, and then how can I lighten up my life in a way? that allows mindfulness to be there all the time. And I'm going to have to let go things. That's just the way it is. And, and every once in a while, I have to come to that realization. So, <laughs> and I think it's normal. So it's not like, uh, uh, you know, it's going to happen once in your life and then you really have to solve everything it's like no every time like sometimes you're gonna go a little too far in one direction and you're like oh, okay no this is i can't i can't do all of this so i'm gonna have to go to the essential and then be present with that <laughs> that's my my take on this Welcome, Avinash. <laughs> uh, do you have a chai? Yes, I ah, very good. <laughs> a true Indian. Yes, <laughs> it, it's coffee actually. Oh. Coffee. black, black coffee. <laughs> good, good, good. Very nice. Uh, can, can, like, can I ask you a question? Uh, of course. Yeah. 
can can we go into the like arupa jhanas using the only anapanasati uh, of course <clears throat> um of course i think the um, the the third kind of uh uh quadrad of instruction in anapanasati is talking about these arupa jhanas when he's talking about the mind becoming aware of the mind breathing in and out and uh but i would say i would say that this it would depend also how we practice anapanasati so if you're trying to look at uh your like the breath on your nostrils the thing is like i just want to make clear that i don't really have anything against that that's fine but i'm just <laughs> i'm just explaining here i i believe that's not the original instructions of the buddha and i think it's just you know it's it's about developing these wholesome qualities like joy uh like calming down the body uh and becoming more and more aware of body and mind as as we breathe breathing is always going to be there but the thing is that because now the instructions have been kind of turned around and saying like look at your nostrils kind of thing uh then that actually gets people st stuck on the body and to go into uh, but, sorry sorry Bante. yes uh the like uh, the exp uh, the word used in anapani sati sutta is a parimukham uh, ah parimukham yes pa parimukham so mukh is like face like in literally it's mean face so i like that that is uh, confu confusion for that uh -huh. like, parimukham is is around the face uh is the tr actually there's a lot of translations for that there's a few different uh words uh for that we can translate i was just looking that up uh, again this month because it's that's that's the word i mean that's the word that originated all of this nostril stuff <laughs> parimukkam <laughs> yes yes because in hindi yes. is 100% face yes like it's yes but muk muk is also can be like at the forefront so actually the translation that i prefer now a days is is like cuz it's uh parimukka parimukkang satting upatapetwa i think that's what the actual pali is and it's like placing m placing awareness or mindfulness presence of mind as one's like for foremost priority like you're sitting down and you're actually dedicating yourself to presence of mind uh that's like pari mukkam can be like as a f like as a foremost thing like a, of importance of of like uh front feature and i was there's a few there's a few different definitions for that one of them is face some of them translated as like in front of their face in front of their like setting ma mindfulness to the front mindfulness uh then then the commentaries as soon as you get in the commentaries it starts to narrow down <laughs> so but um and i mean that's okay but you know i i i don't you know i'm not here to preach anything to anyone that if you don't want to do it that i'm i'm not i don't really care um it's not really my business that's that's anybody anybody's business um that's how i see it that's how i understand it but the the other argument that is pretty undefeatable is that even if that word meant like looking here even if that meant that then already at the first instructions he's saying be aware of your whole body 
<laughs> so I'm sorry, but <laughs> I, re I know this very well because when I was practicing Anapanasati and it was saying I, my instructions from Vipassana yes, were Vipassana, look, yes. look here at the breath Especially, coming in and out. Uh, the go in the energy yes, yes, yes. So it's very forced, uh, like if you do that, it's very forced, like it's nothing like uh, explaining in the Anapana. Exactly, and then f directly first instruction you get, it says, be aware of your whole body. And then for me, I was reading the sutta, and then I was like, what do you mean being aware of my whole body? Do I, am I being aware of this or, or my whole body? Or this and my whole body and my whole body including this? What do you mean? And that was actually a big question that got me started on, on my quest of trying to find another other answers because the Vipassana teachers were uh, tell me the same thing all the time. <laughs> Either I don't know uh, <laughs> or just remain equanimous. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, sure, I understand. But, you know, in that tradition, you can't really doubt the technique because it came from Goenka and he's long gone and that's the technique and if if you try to talk about suttas and all that they're not really knowledgeable that's not their field it's they know the technique and the technique is the technique you don't so if you have questions about hey but why does the Buddha say that in the Anapanasati Sutta they're not really going to be able to answer you um, so Vipassana is a very good introduction for me. I'm very grateful. I practiced four or five years of Vipassana uh, and it was amazing. It really brought a lot to my life and look what it did. <laughs> <laughs> so of course I was really impressed, but at, at some point I realized that, you know, there's a little bit more and I can't, like this is a very closed circle and I, if you want to have answers about the Buddha's actual teachings and suttas, you have to go to the monastic community. You have to really go to people who actually study this and dedicate their lives. Um, and just to go back to your question about Arupa Jhanas, um, it happens many times because these instructions are there with Anapanasati. People are not able, because they're looking here, they're not able to go to the Arupas because they stay here. And the Arupas are not, they're not going to have any kind of physical objects. You can't have a physical object in the Arupa jhana. So it has to be uh, either one of the more further Brahma Viharas or it has to be the clear mind or uh, some kind of still satipatthana practice. Because the mind is detached from rupa, arupa. And if you're looking at your nostrils, that's some, some people are kind of stubborn because they've been practicing that for a long, long time. And then they're advanced meditators. They're really good meditators. They've been very dedicated their whole life. But if they come on retreat, it's hard to break the, you know, these old patterns. And I suggest them, it's happened many times. The reason why you're not going deeper is that you're really, you're forcing your awareness on your nostrils. And that's actually keeping you with the body. And if you actually want to let go and release from rupa, you have to let go of that object. You have to be fully open. Um, and yeah, you can, you can get there with, with looking at your breath, if you like. Uh, if you have joy, if you have the awakening, the Sambo Jangas, if you have the factors of awakening, if you have uh, the joy arising, the tranquility, you can, even if you look at your nostrils, you can get there. That's not uh, impossible. I personally wouldn't recommend it that much because 
It doesn't necessarily develop the qualities that we're looking for, but I've seen people, because it's so deeply ingrained that they just can go there anyways. So, um, yeah. <laughs> That's why we go into much more like the still mind, the clear mind, the quiet mind, we call it, in the Arupa jhanas. So, um, usually we'll have like just radiant joy because loving kindness even loving kindness is too coarse we'll have like radiant compassion or radiant joy and then radiant calm or equanimity and then the mind is just becoming very stable more stable more stable more still and the object actually becomes uh, that's another that's one of my favorite topics uh, of meditation. It becomes release itself. Vosagga Aramana. That's how the Buddha called it. And he actually said, whatever the jhanas you're in, it's all Vosagga Aramana. So it's all based, founded, or resting on release. And Vosagga means either relaxation, release, uh, I think it's a synonym of Viveka. In Singhala, I know in Hindi and in Bharati, uh, Viveka is more like discernment, right? Yes. yes. But here in, uh, in, uh, in Sri Lanka, Viveka, Viveka Gannoa is to take rest, to relax. And I think that is closer to what the Buddha's uh, original Pali was. I was... I was actually quite happy to come here and learn learn that Viveka Gannoa means to go take take a, take a break, take rest, relax a bit. So, um, and then you read like Vosagga. Vosagga actually means relaxation. It's it's one of the terms that it can mean. So, we're slowly. We're slowly moving away from all objects. When the mind is really clear and purified by all these beautiful vehicles and the heart is still, there's no need for objects because the mind doesn't even go out. So, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Uh, ah, yes. Naveen says uh, you can uh, watch the Anapanasati talk that I gave last Sri Lankan retreat. It's on the channel. Yes, I, I you did prob watch. You probably yes. did, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Naveen uh, put some, some heavy pressure so that this talk would come right away. <laughs> uh, uh, Bante, uh, thank you. Uh, I I watch one of the talk uh, of Bhante Bhimala Ramsey uh, and uh, also supported uh, by Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation in some suttas. Uh, like, if you go once, one time in jhana only, I hope it's not too off, off topic. <laughs> so if you go once uh, in a jhana, any jhana, mm -hmm. you leave your body and you born in that rhythm. Ah. Like, <laughs> I mean, it's very, mm. uh, sounds very tall claim. So, uh, mm. like, what, what, what do you want? I think it would be closer to say if, if a certain level of meditation has been attained and is and is maintained at the time of death, um, I would say that is, that is correct. That person is going to go uh, pass on in that realm, which would be a Brahma Loka. Um, I don't think like once, I remember seeing that sutta. Um, I would have to read it again. And you know, to, to be quite honest, I'm always reading the suttas with a very open mind. The, the Buddha said a lot of things. 
and sometimes when you read him and you don't really know the rest that's the problem with the canon there's so much there's so many teachings and if you haven't read the whole thing, it's hard to put everything together. But, um, Teruan Saranay, Kokila? Teruan Saranay, I'm sorry, Bante. No problem. Kamakne. With something and I'm late. <laughs> that's so okay, that's okay. Please excuse my, me being coming in late. That's okay, no problem. Just want to welcome you. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Lord. I know one sutta, the uh, Achara Sangata Sutta, where he's uh, the finger snap, where he's saying if somebody uh, dwells in uh, loving kindness, one is not devoid of jhana, uh, or like one dwells in jhana, even for a finger snap, and one is not does not eat the 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 devotee's food in in vain, or like. Uh, they are practicing the teacher's teaching. And I think, um, I think the merits of, the merits of um, attaining such a state is powerful. Does it really carry on? Like if you attain jhana once and then you just like, live a life of debauchery I don't know <laughs> I, I would still use critical thinking at this point uh, <laughs> uh, maybe maybe because I know at the time of at the time of death it's not like it's not like it goes cut and then you know you just go right to the other other place you know it's like there's there's more of a nuance there's more like a gradual leaving and then you know if you've done some Bar work bardos bardos or something the tibetan buddhists called it yeah. call, call it transition the, phases yes yes also and so um there's even like uh there's some some proofs that are coming to even from science or something like that. I'm not sure, but um, I'm trying to remember where I saw this again. But yeah, so the, the consciousness is not, um, even though the body looks finished, um, the consciousness still works things out. So there's still things happening. And you have like, uh, you know, uh, near-death experiences, like people see light in the tunnel and relatives, um, uh, families and things like that. And so wherever you are on the path, depending on your attachments, depending on your relations, depending on your connections, depending on your intentions and underlying tendencies, you can... A person can let go of, of a lot and just do that process and go and, and could go back to jhana uh, because they will remember that place. Um, because, I mean, it's pretty good. Like, if you don't have a body, it's, there's not a whole lot of distractions anymore, right? <laughs> <laughs> you promoted to Arupa <laughs> Yeah, so it's like, well, you got five distractions less, so that's pretty good. That's a good start. So if you know how to calm your own mind down, you're already doing, you're good. So you have a little bit of time, and then it's like, oh, yeah, this is good. So you can go somewhere nice. Um, but yeah, it depends, like, how much that imprint in the mind, how deep that would be of that jhana and... Yeah, I always, I'm always very careful about these very dra dramatic claims in the, in the canon because the Buddha is not here to, to say that again, if he actually said that or if it was just written after. So, <laughs> what, what I like to see in the canon and what I look for is those teachings that come over and over again in the same template maybe a bit different but similar template in different Nikayas that tells us 
that that teaching is probably pretty solid. Um, like, um, for example, the um, Sabha Savasutta, uh, Majjhima Nikaya number two, <clears throat> all the distractions. That's actually found in the, in a few places in the in the other Nikayas too. And so that tells us that the Buddha was probably giving that teaching quite a bit. Anapanasati and things like that. They're like the Brahma Viharas. <clears throat> but when you have like a bold claim that just kind of sticks out of nowhere and I'm always kind of like, cool, this is really nice to know. But we'll see. <laughs> 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 I mean, that, that will be great if it is true. Exactly. I mean, amazing. Yeah. 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 You have amazing body and you are meditating there. <laughs> like, great. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've seen, I've seen a lot of things and I've seen, you know, I've seen really good meditators like in a retreat, for example, kind of, kind of, leave uh, the meditation or like not really meditation but like the Dhamma kind of world or just like going to do something else or just so not not many but are like seeing sometimes like people that seem to have attained deep stages of of meditation of jhanas and things like that and then their lives is not that virtuous or so it's I'm always a bit careful about these things. It's, you know, we don't want to jump to conclusions too fast or things like that. So, um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes. I thought, uh, I thought it would be uh, nice to print the questions and uh, you know when you were a kid I when I was a, a kid I was watching the 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 TV TV shows or whatever and in the morning like the kids shows and they had like these uh you know oh we have a question from like um uh, Anna in France and she says duh, 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 you know <laughs> And they would like pull out these papers and like kind of read these questions. Um, but yeah, no, unfortunately, I don't have a, a printer or anything. So <laughs> if we don't have a question, I can uh, I can just go to uh, one of the questions that we had. I guess one of the questions was uh, I'm not sure it was a question. But somebody sent me that talk by Ajahn Jeff. Uh, did you guys listen to, to that? Or um, I put it on the group. But yeah. It was talking about stream entry and um, the experience, the experience of stream entry and, and all that. And I thought it was, uh, I thought it was a good, good talk. Um, I mean, I didn't listen to the rest so it was a retreat on stream entry so i'm assuming that uh, ajan ha said quite a bit more about stream entry on that stream entry retreat obviously um one of the i really like that he was uh, actually talking about the experience of the dhamma the Dhamma I, like the Dhamma Chaku, the vision of the Dhamma arising, because that's something that is very often not talked about uh, when we talk about stream entry. So, in the Vinaya, what is said is that very often, and that's not really found in the suttas, that's actually found in the Vinaya, uh, because the Vinaya is also a kind of a biography of the Buddha and the Sangha, even though it's a lot of things bad things that happened and rules had to be made about it but at the same time it's kind of like a linear well semi-linear biography of the life of the Sangha and so there are some really interesting stories and one of the most interesting things in there is that's the only place that you find 
the description of how the Buddha actually taught, which is really interesting. Um, you don't get, like, the suttas, you get the Buddha's teaching, but they don't tell you how the Buddha taught these teachings. And so that's really interesting. And in the Vinaya, you have sequences where there's a lot of people gathered or like a few people, a few monks, and the Buddha would always uplift people's mind, all of his audience. He would talk about the beauty of virtue, of renunciation or letting go, the benefit of letting go, uh, the beauty of uh, generosity, uh, of the devas even. Avinash, you're gonna like that. And he would up uplift, <laughs> he would uplift the minds of his audience because even nowadays, you know, uh, science is backing this up. You know, you're, we are most aware when we're happy, when we're joyful, and our mind is uplifted and present, actually. This is how we pay attention. This is how, you know, we're, we're present and that we learn. And then once he uplifted the mind of his whole audience, then he actually gave the path or like they say the Four Noble Truths. But the Four Noble Truths is, uh, includes the path. So he would just kind of like say, you know, what is that like, like the truth of Dukkha, but there is pain, you know, there is after, after having uplifted the minds of the audience and saying like, you know, look for beauty in these things, virtue, goodness, doing good deeds, uh, generosity, and then remember that there is, there is, there are these aspects, there is that dukkha that arises from, what is the cause? Oh, you guys are muted. <laughs> the cause is wanting, desires. Uh, so the cause of all of our problems is just wanting something that is not. And then to let go of that, that there is, there is a, a way to let go of that. There, there is the release from that also. We can move out of that space and then there's a path and and if you know anything about the canon the canon starts with actually the diga nikaya the long discourses and if you open up the long discourses except the first discourse there's 12 there's a series of 12 discourses they all have the same description of the path in them but the problem is that it's now it's because it's the same thing, now they put dot, 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 ellipses. So we don't realize when we're reading it, but it's actually all 12 first suttas of the canon explain the same path. And so that's pretty, that's pretty clear that this is kind of like what the Buddha taught. That's why the book I wrote called Bhavana, uh, somebody was asking uh, earlier, uh, is about that sutta, the Samanya Pala Sutta, the Long Discourses number two. Because I, I think that's, that's like, if you want to know what the Buddha taught, that's it. That's where to look. And if you want to have like a first impression of what this teaching is, then that's kind of where it is. And those 12, those 11 other suttas, they just repeat that path, just ha have a different story around it. That's it. And so, and it's a very beautiful teaching. And at the end, when he would teach that, usually the Dhamma Chaku would arise in people. And that's kind of understood as they would become, they enter the stream, the stream of Dhamma. And Ajahn Jeff says it, the stream of Dhamma is the Eightfold Path. And once the Eightfold Path is really understood and experienced, and it's all starting to work together, not somebody telling you you're a stream enterer or not. <laughs> when you know 
if you have to ask someone if you're a stream enterer, that means probably not. <laughs> because if you have to be a stream enterer, you have to know the path. That's that's as simple as that. You have to you have to know the eightfold path. And so once you live it, once you experience it, and once you know it for yourself, then you know the Dhamma, you have the vision of the Dhamma arising. That means you just see it like, yeah, that's the path. And you see the Dhamma, you see, you have that vision, you have that capacity. And so, uh, and then I was saying, you, if you don't, <laughs> if you need to ask, and I wasn't targeting anybody, uh, I should have said, uh, if one needs to ask, uh, then a little bit more impersonal. Um, so yeah, I, I like that he was putting emphasis on, on that. But the thing is like, he would have like masses, like massive audiences um, who would like see the Dhamma after his discourse. Now, there's different levels of stream entry, that's the thing, and that's where I'm kind of branching off from any kind of really strict um, claims about this is stream entry, this is the experience of stream entry, and there's nothing else than that. That's where I'm kind of a bit more careful. Um, and which brings me to another side topic which I've noticed is happening more is happening quite a lot nowadays is um, I see a lot of um, meditators mistaking meditation experiences with awakening and these two things are very different so when when we say stream entry is like an experience like it's it's a very strong experience it's like you know turning turning upright something that had been fallen over or like being shown the way to someone who was lost yes that's how it feels um but then people are looking for big experiences nowadays and it's becoming more like a, an American kind of <laughs> uh, Hollywood thing. Um, and I just like, yeah, I just like to, to warn people around that because, you know, don't, don't look for any extravagant, you know, big flashing experiences. Uh, like Ajahn Jeff was saying, like a lot of people think that, you know, that feeling that oneness uh, uh, with, with everything, uh, for example, is, is like stream entry. I've had people thinking like, oh, stream is the stream of consciousness, like the constant awareness. The stream is the Eightfold Path. That's where that term actually comes from. Um, and so we need to know these things in their right context. So... Um, yeah, I mean, there was, a, there was a lot of things, uh, in that talk, but, um, I think, there is, there are different levels of, of stream entry. So there is the path and there is the fruit also. So when the Buddha delivered this discourse, people can see the Dhamma and really feel it. You know, they're like, oh yeah, that's, that's the path. Like that's a really, yeah, that's the path, you know. But then they can lose it too. So, you know, we, we have all these, a lot of the time stream entry is also confused because there's two there's two stream entries there's stream entry path and there's stream entry fruition stream entry path is it means you see the dharma you see the eightfold path you know how it works 
and you, you're practicing that and you're doing good, great, amazing. The, if the stream entry fruition, when it becomes uh, kind of locked in, that's when you can't go back. That's when that knowledge is so firmly established within yourself that you can never go back to, to before life, to like, you know, uh, breaking the five virtues, for example, you couldn't, you just couldn't do it. It's just, it doesn't make any sense. It's like, why would I even do that? It's like you, you feel it right away. You're just hurting yourself. You're hurting people. You're just like, it doesn't work. It's just, obviously that's not the path because now, you know, the stream, you know, the path, you, you know how to practice it. And so the fruit, that is the time when you really have a strong understanding of the Dhamma. And that's, that's not shaking. Uh, there are stages further than this, but I think a lot of people confuse the fruition with the path. So that's also to be... The Buddha said it's an anupubba sikkha. So it's a gradual, progressive training so it doesn't when you know this it doesn't make much sense to think that there is you know all of a sudden your whole entire world is going to be changed and you're just going to see you know like you know pink clouds and butterflies and you know <laughs> that's, that's just not the way it is <laughs> it's a st steady path and you're going to study and you're going to try ask questions meditate and it's going to grow and grow and grow and become very solid and then at some point, you might, of course, insights come that, get, that can be quite strong. But to look for just like one experience as stream entry, I would, I would definitely warn uh, people to, to be careful about that. Because the Buddha clearly said it's, it's a gradual training, gradual path. So Marty's got some beautiful light in in the Vermont. Thank you for sharing the video of Ajahn Jeff. I, when I watched it, I was interested in a few things, well, many things that he said. But one thing he said is that um, it's not a uh, stream entry entry is not necessarily the um, oneness and it's not necessarily the uh, um, he calls it blanking out or mm, right and yet in his discussion he never uses the word naroda or cessation and I guess I would be interested in what you think of that aspect that um, I have heard talk about cessation and um, Naroda, but I'm not really sure where that fits them. Um, if you could speak on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you uh, for bringing up that, that topic. That's the other part. Um, that we could we could say a few things about and it's true so he he says that um that winking out or that blanking out is um is actually the state of no perception uh, actually quite a few people uh, that know about this practice and know a bit more about buddhism know about the no perception the realm of no perception which is like beings that have a body but no perception at all so there's a med there's a meditation that you can do that leads there and your next rebirth would be in that plane basically um, we have to clarify that niroda is not the buddha put it on the map uh, because it was not something like nibbana niroda like these these terms were not 
Vedic terms at the, that were pre predating the Buddha. Those like those are terms that the the Buddha brought uh, in his teaching, as far as I'm aware of, and. Um, the thing is that later it was taken by other spiritual practices and used in a different way. And for me, you know, the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali were my, was my Bible for a while as a wandering yogi. And um, the opening line of the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali is Yoga Chittang Vritti Niroda. So, Chittang Vritti is just another word for like Sankara, Chitta Sankara, because it's just a, a different ways of talking about it. And he says that yoga or union is the complete cessation of the Chitta Vritti. So of all the mental stuff, activities. And so that's a much later text thousand plus years after the Buddha or wait yeah in those waters something like that at least a few hundred years and so you have other you have other kinds of meditations that are not Buddhist that that can lead to a place like that actually you know uh, absorption uh, meditations nowadays I believe these these are states that one can get into that kind of cessation where ses like the perception is kind of shut out completely it's pushed out pushed away but it's it's conditioned and it's it's um, at some point it will come back it comes back because these meditations that push away hindrances for a kind of a just one object for example now it has crept back into the Buddha's teaching unfortunately but I do not think that these were ever Buddhist meditations these are meditations that were picked up and crept back into Buddhism over the years my theory is that the way that I see and understand the history of the of Buddhism we lost the meditation that the Buddha taught from the beginning in the suttas fairly early like a couple of hundred years and then Buddhism went through a lot of hardship um, it was flourishing and becoming very big at some point and then actually it that wasn't really good for itself at the same time because it got to be like so like sponsored by the country government and you know uh, starting to branch out in all these kinds of all these places and you have all kinds of meditation practices branching out of that and I think that we kind of lost the meaning at some point in there and it's been just a really long time since we 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 kind of lost touch with the actual meditation practice um, so the the winking out of perception there's I mean the Buddha talks about it in the suttas you can't really you can't really deny that it's it's quite well proved that it's in there even neither perception or non-perception the Buddha says even in that space because you're starting to let go of awareness itself it's really hard to be aware of that <laughs> so when you're starting to let go of awareness itself like when the mind has been really cleared and purified and usually that's going to be after a few hours of meditation because you really have to go deep for that it's not like uh, you just sit on your like morning hour meditation or anything that's that's not how it's gonna happen but after a few hours in then your mind becomes very very clear you've taken the time you've given your mind parimukha uh, you've made the presence of mind the foremost thing in your life 
So you've, you've sat down and you've started to inquire about your mind and now you see it's really active and you calm it down and it's still active and you calm it down and it's still active and you still calm it down and it still comes up and you calm it down and you do that over and over and over again and at some point it goes deeper and it goes deeper and it goes deeper and it goes deeper because you notice that the distractions in your mind they're actually troublesome they're like tense they're agitated and it's just better to let them go and not engaging with them that's the investigation and then once you've gone deeper and deeper and deeper at some point the mind it just becomes clear that's one of my favorite lines in the suttas pabbastarami dam chittang bhikkave chittang so the mind is radiant the mind is luminous when it is rid of its defilements so when you've let go of the defilements you don't have to make the mind luminous it is <laughs> it already is so it's like kind of pure like going back to kind of what awareness pure awareness is if that existed but even awareness itself has some level of tension in it some level of activity because sankara pacheya vinyana mental activities or mental conditionings create consciousness also so at that level all of the anusayas all of your habitual tendencies all of your uh, underlying tendencies they come up and you you start to break them break them down uncondition these underlying tendencies of thinking of engaging of going out of doing things of like really going out there and then at some point awareness because awareness needs food it needs uh, awareness needs food so it needs so I'm giving a giving a talk while managing the, the thing here um, and the food is the food that was um, like Sankara's is like a, a bit like fat you know <laughs> it's like stored up it's stored up in the mind <laughs> and you have to keep letting it go letting it go letting it go until there's no more of it um, but it's there like it's it's accumulated so that's what your mind will come up with when it has no more external distraction so it will start to feed in itself the things that it likes to feed on <laughs> and once you let go of that then awareness itself it doesn't it doesn't have a topic anymore it doesn't have an object and once it doesn't have a topic it doesn't have an object it doesn't have an activity then it it blows out and that's actually where a lot of people stop a lot of practices stop at the pure awareness behind all things and this is beautiful this is great but the Buddha the, the Buddha went deeper. The Buddha actually saw that there is even tension in awareness itself, that it is fabricated. Consciousness is fabricated, and we can unfabricate it by understanding the cause and what that does, and that it's better without it, it's better to let it go. And that feels actually relieving that's when in these states when somebody comes out of it it's like ah uh, like the heart is open the mind is completely uh, present but also void voidness sunyata and so there is a wise niroda and there is the unwise niroda like for everything <laughs> So yes, there is a way that attaining that kind of stage of meditation 
is done properly with wisdom and there is a, a way of doing it that is not with wisdom, that is just about pushing things away and really dialing down. And cessation can be attained like that, but it's, that's where that plane of no perception happens. Um, and I mean, the, the Buddha in so many discourses talks about Niroda, Samapati, after all of the jhanas. What, what I say is that you don't want to mistake that for any kind of what we call Aryapuggalas, the noble people. Now some, some traditions have attached a kind of a structure that is actually not found in the suttas where somebody would attain Niroda Samapati and then come out of it and then become a stream enterer. And in these traditions, they say, oh, you've attained Niroda, you're a stream enterer. Uh, a second time you've attained it, you're a stream enterer fruition. Or oh, a third time, you're a Sakadagami, a uh, once returner fruit. Another time, oh, you're a Sakadagami fruition. For example, if you read the uh, Manual of Insight of uh, Mahasi Sayadaw, uh, that's, that structure is found in there. You can, you can find that there. It's very uh, explicit, actually. Um, but personally, I never saw any suttas corroborating this. The Buddha just says, talks about the sutta, about the jhanas, you go all the way, then there is a place where the, there is complete release of awareness, there is complete release, cessation, niroda, and then you, somebody will come out of that too, and then, and then keep going. That doesn't, really, that doesn't really mean anything, it just, it's great, it's a beautiful meditation attainment if you do it properly, if we're really talking about Samma Niroda, that I like to call it. Um, but it doesn't mean anything in terms of awakening or Aryapuggala or levels of enlightenment. It's got nothing to do. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I, in a way I do agree with what Ajahn Jeff is saying. And... I just want to be clear that I have very deep respect for Ajahn Jeff, uh, Ajahn Tanisa Rubiku. Um, he's been, you know, he's been there in my life uh, from very early beginning, uh, listening to his talks while I was going to work before I decided to, uh, <laughs> to ordain. So he was actually my lifeline for a long time uh, to the Dharma. So I'm, I, I have the deepest respect for, for him, and um, I did really appreciate his talk. Uh, there's a few things uh, like that. I agree, and then I also think a little bit differently, because we have little, slight differences in meditation practices and teachings, so, yeah. When uh, one experiences such a cessation, would you suggest to immediately return to sitting and meditating or let it kind of work out on its own? It's, um, yeah, you just keep going. It, where, wherever you are in the levels of meditation and the jhanas, even inclusive of Niroda, Sometimes it's like in neither perception, someone will be aware and then awareness will be released so much that they're losing a sense of awareness. So it's kind of hard to tell at this point. It's a bit, it's a bit kind of uh, unclear because awareness is kind of like letting go of even awareness. So it's it's kind of unusual in, in that sense. If you, mm -hmm. you, we're not usually used to that. So it kind of takes a little bit of getting used to. 
but then it's the same path so whether you someone is actually completely diving into niroda and then coming out there's no real reason to stop it's the same thing you just you just continue it's you're basically just relaxing you're just letting go you're just not engaging and that leads you to that place you don't actually need to do anything about it it's just getting detached getting less involved disidentifying even with awareness which is that's pretty deep <laughs> 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 but yeah just continue continuing i mean if 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 somebody feels like they need to take a break for some reason you should always do what you feel comfortable of doing but i don't see any real reason to stop meditating at this point it's just another experience it that falls for me even niroda samapati falls into a meditation experience oneness niroda uh, some people say like uh, they have like crazy outbursts of joy in in other traditions like uh, for example i've practiced vipassana for a long time and in 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 that circle a lot of people have very very strong powerful like uh, very very um very strong experiences like extreme joy or like it's just like bursting out or like they're gonna see something and it's really intense because awareness is is actually being controlled a lot sometimes when some levels of the mind are getting punched through uh, it creates these things and it's really uncontrollable that's why they say don't get attached to the joy is because they're not actually they don't they're not actually developing joy it's just an experience that happens out of the blue so they're not able to control it so it's like don't be attached i've had an experience like that where i had a lot of joy coming up and it was just completely out of nowhere and i spent my whole retreat <laughs> trying to get back there didn't work <laughs> so that was day three i spent like seven days trying to <laughs> Satchitananda, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's that's the that's my that's a really funny because I used to go to a lot of ashrams and practice Hinduism and all these things and yoga and and in the, in these these traditions they have Satchitananda, which is like eternal consciousness bliss and. Uh, in Buddhism, we have <laughs> anicca dukkha anatta. <laughs> so it's like when you hear that, it's like, mm, I don't know which way I'm going to choose. <laughs> They're having a big party over there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And these guys are talking about like suffering and impermanence and not self. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really good marketing strategy, though, for the the other side. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I think my my theory on this is that Satchitananda is is that space. It's actually in the jhanas. We call we call that. Uh, I call it bare awareness, but that's like the plane of nothingness. That's where awareness becomes so clear. It's that awareness behind all things. Uh, it's that pure awareness that is, you know, pristine and it doesn't need an object and it's always there. And it's true in a way. It's always, I would say more like it's possible to get there. But always there, I, I don't know. I think that's the problem with it. It's that it's not always there. <laughs> and yeah, we don't, we don't really have these really extreme um, experiences in what we practice. 
because we're, we're practicing very differently. We're actually cultivating joy in a very wise and calm way that it purifies and it clears the mind. And that's what kind of becomes, like the mind slowly becomes the object, the base of med the meditation. And we're, we're relaxing, relaxing and uplifting the mind, relaxing the body. And so it's a very calm, very, very gentle kind of meditation. So these, these, these really ecstatic, strong experiences tend to not happen that much in, in this particular um, It's actually much more, much more steady, steady progress. And the bliss of release actually is what takes over more and more and more. And so that kind of becomes the main experience of the mind. Um, I'm trying to think. There was a lot of good things about that, that talk. Um, I think we've covered the essentials. And what time is it? Be? Ah, yes. Okay, yes. Can I ask a follow-up question? Mm -hmm. uh, like understanding conceptually what is Eightful Path, like fully understand and have a faith is different thing. Uh, but we need that experience, right? I mean, near the Samapati to like consolidate uh, all of this path. Otherwise, like uh, we do in life, in samsara, in future, right? If, if this is true, then like it's a necessity, like we have to achieve that experience. Like we have to achieve Nirodha Samapati, otherwise this will not consolidate it. I think this is also a trap. So how how we balance this thing? like? In one hand, we wanted it. In the other hand, it's not happening if you want. Like, I mean, what what, what is your? Yeah. yeah, the thing is that I've I've seen I've seen people attaining niroda, samapati, and not really being particularly seemingly fully aware of what that entailed or like what what that would mean and so it just fell as just one more experience that was kind of so some people attain niroda and it it's not really life-changing for them you know <laughs> it's like um uh, and and so it seems and it's you know there's all kinds of Things. you know some people think they're attaining the road and they're not and then some 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 people some people are attaining the road and it's doesn't seem to change them or it doesn't seem like the path is really locked in for them it's doesn't seem like it's actually and I've, I've seen that quite a few times just from other uh, yeah other places and I, I agree with you, Avinash, that actually, for me, I, I am a very strong proponent of, yeah, go all the way, you know, you have to go there and you have to see it for yourself. And yeah, and then the just the layer of security that I add to this is that, w and then we're going to talk about it. And then we're, we're going to talk a little bit about it. And then we'll see how do you understand what just happened and how, what is your perception of that? Because there are more like samatha inclined people. I've seen, I've seen people who like spent a whole day, uh, at least that's what they reported, uh, spent a whole day in cessation. And these people were not to me, didn't strike me as even stream enterers, to be honest. Uh, so, 
the attainment we have we just have to be careful the attainment of these meditation experiences can be very meaningful and it it it, it does have that power it can be very deeply impactful and meaningful and for some other people for some reason it's not <laughs> And so we have to, and that's why I really recommend to always, you know, before thinking that, you know, this is that, or like you've attained this, or somebody has attained this, always to talk to someone who knows a bit more about this, um, to go out and reach out for more information, um, how this should, should be seen, how this sh should be continued forward. And I'm fully there with you, Avinash, that will, I, think, I think one of the biggest of the strengths of this meditation is that attainment, is the possibility of getting there. Because I don't know that many other practices that actually do get all the way there uh, in, in the right way, in the Samma Niroda way. Um, Mahasi Sayadaw explains it in his book Manual of Insight but he's explaining it through a very different route he's using all the the different stages of insight uh, which are not found in the suttas and you know sure okay you can you can take that on if you like but for me if it's not in the suttas I just I just don't buy it I'm sorry <laughs> Uh, it has to be from the suttas at least, and then it has to be solid in the suttas, and it has to be really, you know, anchored. And the path of jhanas is really solid. It's really anchored, and it's really clear. It's, it's everywhere in the suttas. And Niroda is, for some, for some people, it does make a very big imprint, a very big... Uh, impact because they're ready they're like yeah this is the path and and they actually because of that that's why I like Ajahn Jeff talking about the deathless also that's another that's another aspect that I think is too often not talked about <laughs> but there is a space there is the Amata Datu there is a space where there is no coming no going no rising no passing away and in that state there is no consciousness there is no there is nothing it's Nibbana and to to know that this space exists will give you tremendous strength in in your Dhamma practice and in your Dhamma path because you actually know it exists you know it's there uh, you might not be able to tap into that all the time but what I say is that it makes an impression in your mind and even when you're not meditating you can still somewhat know that element and that's where I agree with Adam Jeff and I also have a little bit of a different vision of it is that I think that the Niroda experience exists. It can exist in the right way where it's not just the no perception space. And I also say that that consciousness that doesn't land on anything is also when the mind has had some kind of experience like that. It knows that there is a space where there is no object, there is no topic, there is no Consciousness does not land on anything like like the sunbeam would go through the window and land on the wall. If you remove the wall, it lands on the ground. If you remove the ground, it lands in the sea. If you remove the sea, it just lands nowhere. Just that's it. Because it has nothing to land on. It knows that there's nothing. You're not, you're not an arahant. You're, you might not even be... You know, that doesn't tie to any particular stages of awakening but but to have that understanding is really potent and strong gives gives a lot of strength in the dhamma to know the amata datu to know 
the Nibbana element, that that space exists and you can actually kind of feel it. And, and the, the Buddha said, he said uh, in the Sunyata Sutta, I've discovered this, pla this place that I'm always abiding in is voidness, sunyata. And that's, to me, that, to my own understanding, that's what he's talking about. He's just like, he's been there so long and for so many times, and he's, his mind is perfected. He can just tap into it all the time. He doesn't, like, meditation is great because you don't, obviously, meditation is a pleasant abiding. It's just sukha vihari because you're letting go of the senses and you're not you're not engaging the senses are really coarse as soon as you let them go it's like woohoo <laughs> feels so good <laughs> um but then also there's a way of carrying that and i think advanced meditators are able to tap into that space where Consciousness is resting in that voidness. So while there's activities going on, there can be that just empty voidness that just feels really blissful because it doesn't, it doesn't grab, it doesn't take on anything. Yes, there is that, there is this, there is the flow of life coming, going, flowing around. But there is no tension around it. There is no trying to control it. And so consciousness just sees it. And again, we're talking about anicca sanya, seeing that everything is just a flow, it's just impermanence. And the mind that is capable of tapping into that impression, it just sees that, yeah, it's just flowing, going, arising, passing, there's nothing else that's... You do what you need to do. You do your best. You do good things as much as you can. But you're not like too forward with it. And you're not lazy about it either. You're not trying to get away. You just do what needs to be done. For example, I'd really lo love to sit all day in meditation. Uh, I, like, I, I, I meditate like... F five hours in the morning and then and then I have to go eat because <laughs> because this body needs to live <laughs> and so and then there's other things I live in a monastery so there's people coming and then there's things happening and you know teaching retreats so of course there's gonna be things and we just do it we just do whatever needs to be done um, but there's no, no tension or no, um, no agitation towards that. It's just, uh, detached, at peace, voidness, consciousness doesn't really land, doesn't hold on to anything. So, yeah. <laughs> 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 how to like uh, uh, escape from that trap like we have to achieve that state because it's uh, counterproductive like, achieve that state yeah so that's so the only thing you want to remember is that that state happens <laughs> you're not doing it <laughs> if you follow the eightfold path that's where it's, it's going to get you there you you don't have to do it that's exactly what is going to keep anybody from achieving the deeper meditation experiences because at that at these levels if you try to do something obviously you're you're making a mess in your mind you're just you're not letting go so if you're trying to control, like if you're trying to be in a jhana, or if you want to attain niroda, that is the first thing that's going to keep you out of it. <laughs> For sure, 100% guaranteed. But if you just let it go and you're like, I don't even want niroda, I don't care. I just want 
release. I just want let go. I'm enjoying my meditation. That's what I keep telling even very advanced meditators who are after five hours of meditation, they're trying to they're trying to make something happen, like Niroda or should I do this, should I do that? But they forget to enjoy. <laughs> they forget to enjoy their meditation and then they start to try to want to do things. That's where it goes nowhere. What you want to do is sit back, relax, let it all go. Even Niroda, even Jhana, even everything. Don't even think about it. And... Um, and that's what's going to actually give you the most uh, beautiful meditation, whether you get there or not. If you want it, you have an attachment. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Just let it happen. Like the Beatles. Let it be. <laughs> mm. yeah so usually an hour and a half is usually pretty good for people how do you guys feel do you want some more or do you want some more Niroda <laughs> that's a, a Dhamma geek joke <laughs> Okay, sh should we call it? Well, it's been really nice to be with all of you. And um, wishing you all the best on this month ahead. Uh, wherever you are, uh, beautiful to see you. And that uh, we can share our merits and be on our way. May suffering ones be suffering free, and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share these merits that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty powers, share these merits of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu. Okay, have a beautiful month. Take good care of yourselves. Keep smiling. Lovely Thank to you, see Bante. you. Thank <laughs> you, Bhante. Bye-bye. Thank you, Bhante. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Hmm.